First, I just want to say that being here in Detroit, I'm thinking of Vincent Chin, who was murdered in Highland Park nearby in 1982. And it further punctuates the point about how otherness is a very complex dynamic phenomenon in which others, others are also scapegoated. How many of you know about Vincent Chin? I, I, you know, okay, so I, I think being here in Detroit, many, many people do, so I really appreciate that. Uh, Vincent, Vincent Chin was, um, uh, was born in 1955. Uh, he was uh, at a bachelor's party at a, at a strip club and um, some other people at the bar, um, uh, two white men uh, who were related, um, mis began to kind of uh, think of him as the embodiment of the Japanese car invasion, uh, even though he in fact was uh, Chinese American, uh, they began immediately thinking through a yellow perilist kind of notion that any East Asian was equivalent and uh, a fight ensued. They chased after him out into the street and uh, Vincent Chin was found um, beaten really quite bloodily with a baseball bat um, and died shortly thereafter. I raise this because of course Detroit uh, has never been strictly a black and white town and even if we were to think about the blacks and whites themselves, they're split uh, by hierarchies and differences within each group, and there are also groups within them. And certainly now, today, in Dearborn, we're very much aware of that complexity of how different groups are racialized in very different ways. So I kind of wanted to build on that sense of otherness a little bit more. So this is a, a short, fractured talk on temporal spatial differentiation, okay? So I'm using that language on purpose because in many ways, historians as well as economists, as well as academics, uh, oftentimes will make their claims by complex language that doesn't need to be so complex. Uh, temporal spatial differentiation. Um, oops, hold on. Okay, this, uh, so the talk is what divides us or when republics go wrong. We tend to think of somehow democracy as automatically being immoral uh, set of judgments, but oftentimes democracies, or republics in particular, representative forms of democracies, uh, elected representative forms, oftentimes will make bad judgments. So I kind of wanted to give a little bit of historical perspective on that. Uh, and that um, part of what I wanted to also explore is how this is a story where lines and circles and graphs and charts Um, and this series of numbers, 18th century, 19th century, 20th century, and 21st century, are matters that we need to be aware of in terms of how time and space shifts in various times and various places. And sometimes we return to an earlier point in history because of unresolved issues. Uh, and that, and that uh, de-abstracted and recontextualized, we can begin to understand how certain weighted arithmetic differentiation has operated to reveal a hidden history in plain sight. Some of you may have seen this piece in the New York Times that just appeared last week. Uh, and Part of why it's quite a remarkable piece is that, of course, it's a complex graphic. It also conveys uh, a great deal about the divide between, let's say, policy economists standing on top with a bow tie, a lecturer, an academic, and the divide between a whole hierarchy of, of people. And what struck me about this, uh, well, so, and part of how the point about lines and circles is that you see what is coming out of this academics or this policymaker's head is all sorts of graphs and charts and kind of convincing arguments that is based on numbers. And of course the reaction of the man in red is in kind of clouds and exclamation marks and anger marks. Uh, part of the point of the piece was that uh, we all need to be communicating in plainer, more basic language. And how abstractions represented by lines, circles, graphs, and turbulence um, are so much seen as objective and somehow uh, rational 
and more and superior to emotions. Uh, so for a historian, this is not just a gap of plain language, uh, but it's also an issue of historical perspective and who we're taking into account or not. So that step chart is oddly similar to this one, which comes straight out of eugenics. Uh, this was uh, from Steps in Mental Development uh, in 1913. Our next speaker, Tim Leonard, will be giving more about eugenics. But this whole idea of kind of mental development hierarchies is something that we have not gotten away from. We have, we have rejected the worst excesses of the death camps of eugenics. But in fact, eugenics was based in New York City. It was largely based in New York City. Cold Spring Harbor uh, you know, had the eugenics record office. Uh, the American Museum of Natural History uh, oftentimes hosted international eugenics uh, conferences. And Tom Segrew earlier talked about really a variation of this chart. This is a chart, these circles are of Chicago. Uh, that, that was developed based on a theory of sociologists at the University of Chicago, Ernest Burgess, who tried to capture how, oh, sorry, I have to change. I'm sorry, I'm working both, um, both my, okay, this is the concentral, uh, concentric circus. So, so you see the loop, and then uh, kind of outside is this growing slum, uh, little, Sic uh, little Sicily, for example, the ghetto, zones in transition. And as it grows out, it becomes uh, something that uh, potentially blights other areas. And then the larger areas, the outer sections are a bungalow section. You see restricted residential district, uh, bright light area. So you see these concentric circles. Now, clearly those of us who are aware of so many of the histories of the cities and exurbias outside of the core city are aware of, in some ways, this historical dynamic. This was naturalized by Burgess, but in some ways this is part of the history of redlining as well. Um, and it's important for us as we critique, um, oh, sorry, I keep on. Up. Here's the redlining map of Detroit uh, to understand what these dynamics are and where value was thought to be uh, and where value and risk were thought to be unworthy of investment and how we begin to understand that historically we passed the redlining maps into the 19th century, into the 18th century. And that we have this, for example, uh, as one of the very first uh, zoning maps, in effect, of San Francisco's Chinatown. And this can give you a little bit of a close-up in which you see the color coding is, for example, green for white prostitution, uh, red for Chinese joss houses, which are seen as a heathen religion, a uh, shrine, Chinese opium dens, Chinese prostitution, Chinese gambling houses, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is from uh, 1885. And it was mentioned uh, about polygenesis. This gives you some sense of how uh, polygenesis was imagined. Now, in some ways, polygenesis is seen as uh, the bad boy, the bad uh, science, and somehow monogenesis is seen as the better science. Uh, you can see why some people would say that in terms of the account for the multiple different genesis from different animals, uh, then resulting in uh, not only these racial types, these phenotypes, but also especially in terms of the slope of the forehead. Um, so in the Vietnam War, when people were calling uh, Vietnamese slope heads, it was also going back to that moment of racialization of that lower, more animalistic, uh, fabled uh, forehead. But it's not simply, of course, uh, a question of, uh, of polygenesis. Also, there are plenty of theories that were premised on a monogenesis, but then somehow people who migrated to different climates then developed different skin colors. And in some ways, uh, that argument has been just as problematic in the history of race. So it's not strictly nature as the enemy uh, of polygenesis, but also questions of how nurture is operated. So we really have to, of course, now begin to understand how nature and nurture are in far more complex combinations than we tend to acknowledge. Um, and part of what's going on here 
is how these arguments, both of place and uh, nature, were argued by, uh, by someone such as Madison Grant, who wrote The Passing of the Great Race, who was one of the foremost uh, eugenicists and really quite a popular writer at the beginning of the last century. And he was really arguing for how there was a hierarchy of European groups. That, of course, there were the Nordics, the Northern and Western Europeans. And then there were the Alpines, who were the Middle Europeans, the Eastern Europeans, and then, uh, God forbid, the Mediterraneans. And this fueled, in fact, the 1924 Immigration Restriction Act, which greatly dropped the number of Eastern European Jews, for example, and the numbers of Italians coming to this country off the cliff, just about to zero. Now, I'm jumping around in time periods here, but I want to make some visual connections because this question of who belongs, who doesn't belong, who is someone who is a self, of we the people and who is considered an other, of course, shifts from different parts of the country at different times. So this uh, well-known image uh, that was painted by John Gast for actually a railroad uh, tourist uh, advertisement encouraging people to take the railroad and go to the Midwest, uh, of course, is representing really our understanding of manifest destiny which is both a religious, spiritual kind of calling to occupy the land in the face of the dispossession of not only the native peoples, but also of the buffalo and the animals and the wilderness itself. So you see the railroad, the, telephone, the, the telegraph lines, and uh, the ships in the background on the upper right, um, really being uh, talking about American progress, which is the major title of this piece from 1872, or the other title is Westward Course of Destiny. Now, again, I'm jumping around this time to 1783-84, when the Empress of China is the first ship of the new nation to go trade with China. I skip here because, in many ways, the stakes of this argument are quite profound, but it also shows another binary that has been falsely separated. In this case, it's the binary between Hamilton, who supposedly talked about building wealth by trade, versus Jefferson, who supposedly mainly talked about building wealth by land. But in fact, the two phenomena were far more intertwined in complex economic ways. So you had uh, the uh, China trade, uh, largely uh, developed through New York City, especially after the uh, Erie Canal was completed. So you had the great numbers of resources from the Great Lakes and the Upper Midwest going into New York and being shipped out in ships going to all over the world, but especially to China. And you had the customs office of New York in the era before income tax accounting for 70%, 70% of the public monies for construction work. Uh, and for also the purchase of Louisiana from the French. So we have a more complex dynamic in which trade actually fueled land development and the possibility of Jefferson's idea of uh, white household um, farms um, throughout the nation. And all of this really resulted in uh, oops, excuse me, let me just, and, and this was framed by Hamilton as political arithmetic. Um, so this question of political arithmetic is actually at the foundation of a lot of these historical dynamics in which dispossession, trade, uneven development, and land expansion happens. Now, in 1882, this nation passes the Chinese Exclusion Act. It's an act that most Americans, even though we've read about it in our high school textbooks, maybe we've looked at a paragraph about it, actually don't know anything about. But this act uh, existed from 1882 effectively until 1968 as a consequence of kind of yellow perilous fears. Um, I want to quickly kind of get to the heart of the discussion now. <coughs> in terms of referencing the well-known Max Weber book, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, but to pair it with a book I highly commend. It's written by a British sociologist that's kind of been obscured, but I think it especially helps us understand the present moment. The book is called Loss and Change, in which Peter Maris is really looking 
uh, at working class communities, especially in the East End of London. And one chapter is about displacement uh, that is happening in that community. Um, so that here the lines and circles uh, actually are linked to questions of the Protestant work ethic, the spirit of capitalism, uh, but also in terms of what hardworking class communities did when they lost their homes, and they're beset with sudden and dramatic loss. Now, part of the story, of course, transposed in this US cartoon, is the story of hard work and a good Calvinist white male's return home to the cat, the two children, and the wife, and the dinner already. And of course, you see above the door uh, the individual male, white male, and also the family's relationship to the, Almighty, to the Almighty. Now, I'm jumping again because these are connected to the story of Pope Nicholas issuing the papal bull in which uh, any Christian ship explorer, any Christian captain, can claim uh, any heathen lands. And of course, that later gets separated between the Treaty of Tordesillas Tor uh, in 1494 and the Treaty of Zaragoza in 1529. Um, so this question of who can claim what in the world but also what the rights of the white man are, are deeply intertwined in these questions of self and otherness. Uh, and it really culminates in this jumping around with the Chinese Exclusion Act. And I just want to point out this whole question of meat versus rice, which now seems absurd, but rice at one time was seen as some foreign exotic dish, just like pasta was, okay? Uh, and that the idea of American manhood, American white manhood versus against Asiatic coolism, which shall survive. This was penned by no other than Samuel Gompers in 1902. Of course, he was the founder of the American Federation of Labor. Um, and that this, these images uh, very much are about this idea of a bogey, this idea of a yellow peril that's infecting and violating uh, the possibilities of what the proper white working class family can be. And here you see that same cartoon with its, it's shown fully in which the white family is contrasted with the heathen, the heathen Chinese who are basically sleeping and eating in such a great concentration that they're congested but also sleeping and eating with rats and eating rats themselves. Now, this is a time in which the Working Men's Party, led by Irish immigrant Dennis Kearney in San Francisco, was in the sandlots of California talking about how the monopolies must go, the big four monopolies must go, but also that the Chinese must go. And what happens is that the Chinese are seen as a monopoly. Here, they're seen as being so uh, so productive and so efficient that they're controlling all the industries and leaving the poor white boys out in the alley and being sent off to the reformatory. And this is the Sandlot's demonstrations. You could see some of the signs in the background that say down with the Chinese. And this is really the backdrop with the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, city hall of San Francisco in the background. Um, so what does this result in? This results in the building of a wall. So the wall has been both powerful uh, in actuality, the immigration exclusion laws, and the new bureaucratic system that's set up of photo IDs, first time in the country, uh, detention centers, first time in the country, in which those detained have no rights whatsoever. Uh, but also, of course, uh, literally the uh, the, the kind of cordoning off of the borders as well. Um, and just as uh, this, the wall is being built up, uh, then the, uh, the call for an open door policy of free trade, laissez-faire trade with China, uh, is being imposed upon places like China uh, with the tearing down, supposedly, of the Great Wall that's there. But I just want to read a quote from Peter Maris. 
Recovery from bereavement. This is about loss. Recovery from bereavement varies with the circumstances of loss, the nature of the loss, and the past history of the bereaved. Each of these factors seems to be closely related to the ability to construct or reconstruct meaning, to make sense of what has happened and assimilate, into, uh, assimilate it to present circumstances in a purposeful way. In many ways, I think, this begins to describe not only a dilemma of that time in which immigrants, white, white immigrants, were basically othering others. Irish, of course, were the subject in the East Coast to brutal racism and viciousness and violence. But as they moved west, they could also other another, either African Americans or Chinese or other folks as well. And this question of excluding Chinese somehow temporarily, politically, in the election cycle, assuaged a certain kind of pent up frustration and anger. But of course, it never really addressed the central questions at, at hand. So we return to this question of, can we reckon with the past, especially past that we don't know about? Why is it that we don't know about? Why is it not a part of the civic story of what America has fought through and struggled through? Why has Chinese exclusion disappeared as well as other stories of dispossession? Why have those disappeared? Most New York City residents have no idea who were the original people of New York City, the Lenape people. So what disappears? But also, uh, can we recognize how the past continues to exist, especially those disappeared elements that we've never reckoned with in the present day itself? Now, I'm just going to quickly scroll through this and just show you a more complicated political cartoon. Um, Frederick Keller of the WASP, yes, that was the name of the publication, a weekly satirical publication that was really very anti-Chinese, um, had a more ambivalent cartoon. And this is the one, if, if you can kind of see it. Uh, I'm going to do a close-up. There's a man who's speaking to the audience. And he's really kind of uh, making a point and I think asking a question as well. And the point that he's making here, hidden in the smoke, is the real Chinaman who's, uh, who's at the root of all evil. So who is the real Chinaman? Well, it could be this figure, who's on the right margin, who is a caricature of a Chinese man who's pulling the lever of the giant machine. But it's also really this question of progress. It's a question of the raw materials uh, that are going into this giant machine and spitting out all these goods that are being made in greater and greater quantities for cheaper and cheaper amounts. And the people who, uh, who have been dispossessed, um, dispossessed in that first image, those white workers who are no longer working because of the change of the mode of, uh, of, of production um, really are caught in this dilemma. Who then is the real Chinaman? Is it the Chinaman who's actually working in some of these jobs or pulling that lever, or is it the machine of progress? So I just want to leave it there and perhaps provoke some questions about the complexity of the world that we lived in before and the world that we still live in today. Thank you very much.